All right, everyone, welcome back to another groundbreaking episode of Ed Up Career Schools, The Scoop with your host, Kathy Belletti. Today is going to be a lot of fun because I've been trying to talk about this topic for a very long time, and it's all about managing a team remotely. I mean, since the pandemic, there were so many teams that had to go remote, and some people were still trying to play catch up and still are. Okay, but to help walk me through this topic, I have Mr. David Alba. He is actually the Senior Director of Admissions with yes. the College of Healthcare Professions. Hey, David. Hey, hey how's it going? <laughs> Pleasure to be here. I know we've been going back and forth trying to, you know, get our, uh, our, our times together. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Let's make this happen. Look, third time is a charm, right? <laughs> yeah, third time is a charm for sure. <laughs> All right, awesome. So you know what, David, you have a very extensive background in higher education, specifically admissions. So yes. I always want to start off with asking, how did you actually start your journey? Because every time I ask this question, we're, we're not live, right? We're not live, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can, can we start again? I'm sorry. I, I stumbled on my words. You're all good. Talk okay. to us about how you got into the industry. Because some people are like, oh, I stumbled on the industry. Some people was intentional and some people was an accident. What's your story? Yeah. So um, it's quite interesting the way I, I fell into the education industry. And it was right when I was going to graduate from the University of Texas, El Paso. Oh. Um, digital media major. Um, young. Didn't know what I was going to do other than TV and radio for the rest of my life. Um, so I sat down with my counselor and I, I you know, I, I asked for some advice and she said, there's three routes you can go in that will always be needed. And I was like, what might that be? And she said, criminal justice, law enforcement, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, of course, she said the healthcare field. And then she said uh, the, in, the education industry. So I was like, well, you know, I'm in TV and radio. How's this going to work out? So eventually... Um, I became a father at, at right when I finished uh, graduating from UTEP and um, radio and media was not going to pay the bills. So I was fortunate enough to land an admissions representative job. Uh -huh. I always believed in education and I fell in love with it, with being able to change somebody's life. So it meant it meant a lot to me. I gravitated towards uh, being able to help others that don't necessarily have to go with the four year, five year degree. Mm -hmm. Um, and at that point, I, it just kind of grew on me. And 15, 16 years later, I still find myself doing it with joy. Wow. Yeah. So why not criminal justice? Because that was the third choice. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, it just wasn't for me. I wasn't ready to be out there in the streets. I'd rather be sitting in an office preparing people to go out there and be in the <laughs> office. So. Yeah, gotcha. that is awesome. So let me ask you, what do you find the most invigorating about your role, your role specifically as a director? Because it seems like some more uh, more people are trying to run from the role <laughs> nowadays. Yeah. yeah. What keeps you here? It's it's really just being able to make a bond and a relationship with with the students through my admissions representatives, right? Um, I think when I first got into the industry, it was really about quote unquote changing lives, but I think you're really changing their opportunity to give them something more than they never had. So it's giving students the opportunity. So when I, when I think about it and I wake up every day, um, I kind of measured this today and I said, if I can go 30 days and I look at 30 days in a month and work 30 days, if Three days out of those 30 days are not so good, but the rest are really good. I'm in a place where I'm needed. And that's how I feel that I'm at right now. So being able to inspire um, my admissions representatives through coaching, mm -hmm. being able to uh, teach and also enable and give them the opportunity to reach out through students through my techniques of, of uh, it's all about the student. It should be customer service focused, but you should also be able to overcome obstacles is what wakes me up to say, I got to be competitive. I got to win. The only way I'm going to do it is if I help my reps change people's lives and give them the opportunity to do so. So that's really what, what wakes me up and keeps me going in this industry. I love that. I, I wish you guys, I uh, really hope you guys are taking notes because that's very important. Advisors, they struggle. 
in this role a lot. And a lot of times it's yeah. because our students, they're not easy to deal with. But I loved what you said as far as, you know, three days are horrible, but four days are amazing. That's what keeps me. That is cool. Yeah, I really like that. That is awesome. So, OK, here's the thing. You have worked for ground campuses yeah. and you've also worked for online campuses. Correct. All right. Here's what I have seen when it comes to advisors specifically. I've right. seen so many advisors who have, you know, their entire career was ground campuses and now they're transitioning to an online school and they're like a deer in headlights. I have no idea how to do this job all of a sudden. And I totally get it. Because being able to sit in front of a student, you can read their body language. Some people like me speak with their face, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you, can, you can tell if a student is interested or not. But now to go online and you're like, how long do I have to be on the phones again? Yeah. How do you actually help those type of advisors transition into that online role? So that's that's a great point. I mean, in, in the online setting, there's a couple of different factors you can consider. And it's, do I enroll somebody strictly through a phone? Do I jump on a meeting just like we're doing now so I can mm -hmm. see somebody to read their body language? Mm -hmm. So depending on what the methodology is for the company and the way they want to stand by enrolling students, I think the bottom line comes down to, and this is going to sound real simplistic, can you feel and can you hear a heartbeat on the other side? Mm -hmm where there's there's a soul behind wanting a change right and and if you can balance that and understand that really digging deep into someone's personal life and understanding where they need change and helping direct them by overcoming obstacles that they don't really think they can do it doesn't matter if you're on the phone or whether you're on a zoom call mm -hmm. um, because it, it does come back to can you read the room can you feel the temperature of the person on the other side of the phone? And, and is it sincere? Are you sincere? So I think those are the basics is really, are you doing it for the right reason? So whether you're in a building and you're seeing students face to face, or we're in a Zoom call where I can see and, and read you, or whether we're on, on, on a phone call, it still is all about the connection. So if there is no connection between you and the other person, it's probably not going to work. So it's it really comes down to just being empathetic, sympathetic, mm -hmm. and and making sure that you're doing things for the right reasons and all the ethical reasons that would justify a student to even join your school. Yeah, that's true. You know what I found also? That's how you knew if those were advisors who were really good at their jobs, okay? Yeah. So yeah. Th there's some people who started off online, they're doing amazing, and the same thing with ground campuses, right? Yeah. But it, it had me thinking, if it's this difficult for you to go from seeing a student face-to-face -to, -face to building the same relationship on the phone, what were you really doing, <laughs> you know? Because it's the same questions, but now tonality plays a bigger factor. Huge. Right. And the questions that you ask on the phone to keep the student engaged. So it's like now you really have to focus on that connection. Right. And not just, OK, I need to get to an enrollment. I need to get to an enrollment. Yeah. Okay? No. Yeah. Wow. You, you nailed it. It is that connection. Mm hmm. So what do you think is the key when it comes to managing expectations when you can't just walk down the hallway and peer into someone's office every two seconds? The reason why I ask this question is because I know so many um, people that I've come into contact with and they're like, this is driving me crazy because I'm used to being able to peer into the office and it's like, okay, they're working, they're on the phone. Yeah. How do you actually manage that online? So I, th I think it all begins from understanding the culture of the team mm -hmm. and do you have the right people to fit the mission that we're trying to accomplish? Um, and sometimes there might not be the right representatives there. So you almost like, might have to hit the reset but button and build from scratch. And what I mean by that is being able to identify the characters that are going to be self-disciplined, the characters that are going to be able to be dedicated and self-motivated and be able to say, spend that time away from their family to be dedicated to in-house, online, mm -hmm. uh, being able to work seriously. So to answer your question, with that being said, 
is there has to be some kind of platform where we can communicate, right? So for instance, uh, there's Slack, you know, there's Teams. Mm -hmm. And by using those mediums, you make it clear that this is a number one way we're going to conversate. And when I bing you, I might bing you for reasons to say, hey, I need a student to have X, Y, Z, or I might bing you just to say, how are you doing today? Or I might just say, let's jump on a Zoom right quick. And I think the luxury that we have by having these different mediums allows us to almost walk into their office, if you will. Um, because if they're responsible enough and they're, they're part of the culture that you're building and that you're you're foreseeing, that you want to build winners, they're going to answer. They're going to be there. They're going to be working. They're going to be dedicated. So then it becomes, are we adults here or are we just trying to fish? To that part. Are we just trying to fish? You know, mm -hmm. are we trying to just milk the clock, so to speak? Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's just finding the right individuals that will almost uh, almost do anything and everything, not only for you, but for the student and for the sake of the company to win. That's interesting because um, you mentioning if you have the right team, um, I find that a lot of leaders, they struggle with that, you know, because what's, with what's going on with the economy, no one wants to see anyone lose their job, right? And what I'm finding is there's so many leaders who are struggling with, ah, I've been giving this person chance after chance after chance. At what time, at what point do I cut the cord? But then it's that guilt factor, like, Oh, I don't want to take any food out of someone's kid's mouth. Exactly. But it gets to a point where you have to make the cut. How do you actually deal with that? Well, I think I think one of the biggest rules I learned as a director is just telling somebody no. You know, it's probably one of the toughest things that you can do as an individual, um, especially as a boss. Um, but sometimes saying no is a good thing, not only for yourself, but also for the person on the other side. And mm -hmm. and it, to, to give you an example, if, if this is not the right person and they continue to make the same mistake, are they the right fit for us? No, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if, if we sit and we document and we teach and we coach and we repeat and we use the, I can say, you know, the edge technique where you educate, you demonstrate, you guide and you enable them to, to fulfill their obligations, but they're not, then it's like, no, right? So it's really finding the people that aren't gonna be yes, man, but also the people that are going to challenge you to say, how can we get better? How can I get better as a boss? How can I find a representative that's going to go above and beyond for students so that we build that winning culture? So I totally agree with you. I understand that in this day and age, it's hard to tell somebody no <laughs> and, and, and to cut somebody off and, and to take food off of somebody's table. That's not the intention because I'm not here to fire people. But at mm -hmm. the same time, you know, we have to demonstrate and perform. Yeah. You know what also needs to happen? I think that this needs to be included in the representative's interview because yeah. sometimes we are not painting the full picture of yes. what this role actually looks like. When I used to interview advisors, look, I used to scare the heck out of them because <laughs> if you still want this job, <laughs> yeah. okay, now we know we got somebody that we can work with, right? But I yeah. think sometimes leaders are falling into that trap of trying to paint this rainbows and unicorns picture. Yeah, no because they want to hire them and they need staff. And then when the person gets there, they're like, hold on for a second. You didn't tell me any of this. Now you're struggling to train this person repeatedly. And now you face that, should I put them on a performance plan or should I just cut the cord? Yeah, yeah. And then you, you start wasting not only your time, their time, the company's time, and it's, it's just not best for anybody. So uh, it, it is difficult to sometimes, you know, you might need, an extra representative, but if you don't have the right person to fit the culture, then you don't should shouldn't have to rush into hiring somebody. So yeah. I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. What was the most challenging part for you transitioning from ground campus to online manager? Um, I would say, I mean, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of stumped there for a minute, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's just finding people that are going to believe in the system. Right. Um, because not everybody wakes up every day saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to work from home and I'm going to kick tail. No, it's it's finding people that are going to represent what it is to be successful. Mm -hmm. That was the most difficult part, because 
when, when if I'm in Texas and I'm in San Antonio and I'm hiring somebody that lives in California, Los Angeles, I don't really know that person more than you and I right now looking at each other and talking to each other. So how can I trust that person? How can I believe in that person? And it's spending time investing in them so that they can feel uh, valued because mm-hmm. it's it's about it's about your representatives at the end of the day. It's not necessarily about the director. It's mm-hmm. because, and it goes back to what we talked about at the beginning of the conversation. Can I bleed my wisdom and my knowledge to my representatives to to be what I used to be? And that was the best representative ever, right? Doesn't that all admission <laughs> reps say that? Uh-huh. But, but the most challenging part is really just finding the right people for the culture. Hmm, that's interesting. So I know a lot of leaders fall into the trap of micromanaging, okay? And I'll be honest with you, because before I started training online teams, I never understood it because my entire career was strictly ground campus. So I used to see these advertisements for online colleges. I'm like, how do they do that? Like, yeah. how do you, <laughs> how do you like, stick a somebody? Yeah. You know, yeah, right? But then when I had the opportunity to train a couple of online schools, I'm like, oh, this is actually really cool. And here's one thing that I noticed is sometimes the leadership, they were having a hard time keeping the teams motivated. Going back to our point earlier, because they couldn't say, hey, everybody come into the office for a quick stand up meeting. Right. Or they couldn't walk down the hall and, you know, check in on their advisors. But they also find that the advisors, sometimes they get demotivated also being at home in the box by themselves. So what are some things that you do to keep your team? I think think it boils down to the creativity and um, Mm -hmm. competition from within. Um, And then understanding the individual representatives, because you could have 10 representatives. And for example, if I say, what does the definition of broke mean to you? Mm -hmm. Somebody might say... Hey, you know what? I have $500 in my account. I'm broke. Somebody might say I'm negative $500 in my account. I'm broke, right? So identifying and understanding where each individual is coming from and what motivates them, I think allows you to still challenge them on a one-on-one basis. Uh, But then when you come together collectively as a team, it really turns out to uh, and I, I keep repeating it. Are they part of the culture? Are they part of I'm here to win? I, I want to support the vision and the mission. And and you just have to be real creative. Uh, for example, there was one a few times where um, I had an, a, an associate director who was also working me online and we would we would play like if it was a, 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 a national live radio uh, station. And I'd be like, oh, you are now turned into uh DJ David at the Wheels of Steel. Who do we have here? And then I'd pick on a representative to come in and they'd represent like, hey, I'm calling from Los Angeles and I'm here to change somebody's life today for X, Y, Z. So doing things like that in the huddle or or playing bingo or or playing, uh, what else did we do? Pictionary and and things that you would do in the office, but you can also do through Zoom, I think helps keep people motivated. And Mm -hmm. then uh, just 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 challenging them to to hit certain uh, expectations to join a raffle. There's there's all kinds of things just about staying within the lines of compliance that can help you be successful. I love that response. First of all, that that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sounds like yeah. a lot of fun. I think sometimes leaders may feel like some of the ideas they come up with are corny to their team, especially yeah. when you're dealing with tenured advisors, right? But you right. never know unless you actually try. Some of them may lead the way and say, you know what? I'll actually pitch in and I'll lead that game. But yeah. you have to at least try. What about managing their start expectations? Okay. Because uh, I know sometimes that can get a little difficult and challenging too. Yeah. yeah. You're only as good as your last start is what they say, right? Yeah. So um, I think having clear expectations from the beginning Mm-hmm. Setting the right definition to outline uh, metrics that need to be hit and having a plan from a director's perspective that would help support them reach that goal is very important. We can't just tell a, represent, uh, a representative, go get me eight enrollments and not give them a plan to lead to success. There you go. You're going to be able to yield more value by teaching them and showing them and saying, here's the outline, here's the playbook. Now go play on the field. 
Um, and a lot of times, like kind of the old school way, it's just like, go do this, go do that. But those days are long gone. So if you're able to invest into what you want to uh, turn out to be a win for you, then it's going to happen as long as you're doing it from a sincere place in your in your coaching mentality and in the way you treat people. People will run through a wall for you. True leadership. Truly, I always say true leaders um, have teams who are there not because they have to be, because they have families that they need to feed, but because they want to be. And those yeah. are the people who's going to stick around and they will stand up for you. They would fight for you. <laughs> That's the type of team that you need to have. Exactly. It's funny. Um, when it comes to the expectations, I was listening to something um, earlier this morning and it made so much sense. Uh, is there really a such thing of unrealistic goals? I really don't think that there is. I think people feel that there's unrealistic expectations because they're not given the tools and the direction to actually make it happen. Yes. So if you don't know how to get there, of course, everyone is going to be like, well, that's not realistic at all. When in fact it can be, you just need some type of direction. Yeah, exactly. When you make it simplistic and, and easier for people to understand how to get to the finish line, mm -hmm. instead of, of saying, I want you to get here, but you show direction and you almost build out a map for them to get there, mm -hmm. you gain more respect and you, you gain yeah. more trust. And it falls back to what we talked about. You know, you, you have people that will fight for you. Exactly. So let me ask you, David, where do you yeah. actually see the future of a career education? Oh, gosh. Um, I think <laughs> it, it definitely is um, um, moving to a new level that we've probably never even thought of. I mean, there's so many uh, different traits that are calling for demands right now. You think of like, uh, you know, radiation, uh, you know, therapy, or you think of, of a tur turbine technologist, right? Um, can you sit back and learn all of that online to work in the industry? Yeah, you actually can. Um, can you be in virtual um, laboratories in a Zoom? Can you get into, I mean, you think about it. Nowadays, kids are playing virtual reality with goggles on. Exactly. So I think it's going a lot more in that direction. Is it going to happen overnight? No. But the reality of it is, I mean, um, what is it? The 15 minute cities? I don't even know. If, yeah, I'm sure you know about that. Yeah. So everything's got to be quicker, faster mm -hmm. and uh, uh, almost like microwave expectation for the future of education. And people are going to want information and they're going to want to graduate and they're going to want to work quick. So I think it's things are probably going to be sped up a lot faster. I definitely agree. Definitely agree. Well, here is a question from the left. OK, so. Okay. If you were to look back at yourself at the beginning of your career, um, what advice would you offer to yourself? Prepare for a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's never anything that you can count on in the life of admissions other than change. That's the only thing that's ever going to be constant. And I, if I was to tell my younger self, um, what it would take for me to get to the different levels that I have is you can get there a lot faster, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't change anything for, for the life of me. But I would say prepare for a roller coaster ride. I love that. And I think that needs to be implemented from elementary junior high school, high school, because yeah. I really feel as if we're not doing that much of a great job preparing the next generation for how this world really is. I, I, I feel like sometimes when I listen to speeches, it's like, if only that were the case, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. So, some people may gain more from a, a speech where it's like, all right, you're about to go through hell, but guess what? Yeah. There's the brightest side. Yeah. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> the sun will rise again. Exactly. Do you have any final thoughts for our audience, David? I would just say that, you know, working in admissions, it tends to be a lost art nowadays. But if you really have a passion for changing someone's life and not being a quote unquote used car salesman, but really believe in education mm -hmm. and you really want to inspire to motivate and not only change and break 
um, um, different, different, uh, what's the term I'm looking here for? Um, um, uh, different boundaries of where families have went generation and generation before you want to give somebody an opportunity. There you go. You want to give somebody the opportunity to get to a height that they never believed that they could admissions is for you. And, and I think that it's not, it's not praised enough as this is a really good job that can bring you a lot of internal, um, um, wealth. Mm -hmm. And and I think if you are able to understand that we're not counselors and we're not therapists, even though we might feel like it, uh -huh. if, if you really jump in the boat with somebody to help them get through all of the minutia, you can make a great career in admissions. Absolutely. Love it. I hope you guys wrote that down. OK, <laughs> David, thank you so yes. much. You have been amazing. You have dropped some gems and I know that you've helped a lot of advisors and leaders out there. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for the opportunity, Kathy. Absolutely. And thank you guys for joining. Until next time. Bye. Bye. I really hope that you enjoyed that episode. I have been working diligently to bring awareness to career schools. There's so much that they have to offer our students and our community. Every single role within the admissions process is critical, whether you're a part of the admissions team, financial aid, career services, academics, everyone deserves a voice. Admissions is the first point of contact for your school. So you want to ensure that you have a team who exudes confidence, passion, and a clear understanding of effective communication with our potential students. I totally understand the pain of missed class starts, low appointment and enrollment conversions, and this is why I created Next Level Admissions Training by Motivate with KAT. This platform is a step-by-step -step process, and it is going to train your new and tenured advisors in every single step of the enrollment process to ensure that our students are inspired, and they're ready and prepared to start class. Admissions is not easy. It can be very challenging, but it's definitely worth it. So if you're ready to take your school to the next level, head on over to lessons.motivatewithkat.com and check out Next Level Admissions.